the next right thing to do is the next right thing to do. And for me, it's bearing witness and testifying as a part of the community of life as we head into certain death. That's what it is, but it's joyful. And I want people to be able to mine that joy and feel good about the thing that they're experiencing, which is amazing life. Well, Jordan, I am thrilled to have this conversation. As you know, I'm not doing a whole lot of post-Doom conversations anymore. I've, uh, I did a whole bunch from the summer of 2019, I guess. Yeah. Uh, until about a year ago. And then I've only done a couple uh, in the last year. But you and Karen, your involvement in the post-Doom, no gloom conversations, uh, discussions that we've been having have been so rich. And I've so appreciated every time you've shared that I knew that I wanted to have a post-Doom conversation with Karen, which I did, which was the last one that I uploaded, uh, which actually was, it started out to not be a official post-Doom conversation. We just started going and spiraling. And I was like, and I, when Connie watched it, uh, she was like, I'm going to edit that. We're going to put that up as a post-Doom on, on the benefits of, of collapse acceptance. And I wanted to have a conversation with you, and I'm actually going to go back to some of the questions that I've typically asked uh, my various, you know, I've now had 80, I think Karen's was the 80th post-Doom conversation, so this will be 81. But I like to begin by just asking my guests to share just a little bit, take, you know, five, six, seven, eight minutes, whatever, but help us get you. Like, for those who have never heard of you, they don't know anything about you and Karen, they don't know about Chicken Foot Ranch. Uh, or the documentary that included you all, uh, basically help us get you, like share, don't be bashful, like help us understand sort of who you've been, what you're known for, what you're proud of, what you're engaged in, and that sort of thing. We'll start there. Great. My name is Jordan Perry, and I'm a civilization addict. <laughs> Good start. <laughs> and I used to say, hi, my name is Jordan Perry. I'm an American activist. And that was when Karen and I were traveling across the United States to protest the Keystone XL pipeline in front of the White House and get arrested as part of the largest environmental action movement um, to that date and since, at the time when direct actions still seemed like the right course. And through that trial by fire, through that trip, starting from let's put solar panels everywhere and windmills everywhere and fix this thing with some economic policies enacted through our current government, which is the best we can possibly have given the other outcomes. Through that course of that trip, stopping and seeing the whole United States, so much beauty and so much destruction, stopping and staying at a mountaintop removal location in West Virginia, which we stayed at for an extra day because Hurricane Sandy was hitting the area of Washington. And so we were, we couldn't go to get arrested on our, on our day. And we went with a man named Larry Gibson and he's a passionate fighter. He's deceased now. And his family had lived for generations on this hilltop and they were trying to kick him off the hilltop and blow it up. And he took us on this walk through this village, this ridiculous little family village in the in the Appalachias and as we crested the hill to see the devastation of mountaintop removal and he gave us that speech and he said you know don't come here as a tourist West Virginia can't do this alone take this on your heart and go back and I said I said to him I have it on tape I said I will not let you down Larry mm. and I was changed in that moment mm. I've always been um, rolling it back. I'm, I'm a city kid from Oakland, born and raised in Oakland in 1968 to counterculture parents who were, I guess, hippies, however you want to call it. And mm -hmm. um, my mother was very young. She was seven. She was uh, 19. She was 17 when she had my brother. My dad was very young too. And um, the, the process of growing up in that environment was foundational to me. My original stories around the campfire were about being wild and free. Mm -hmm. And I took that on. Um, I don't love personal stories, but I'm going to be vulnerable here. And uh, my mother was murdered when I was seven 
someone broke into our home and shot her and that person was never found. And then my father, who I eventually went to live with, died um, as a complication from type one diabetes when I was 16. But the last three years of his life were miserable. He had, his kidneys failed. He went into dialysis treatment. He was a, he was a passionate and vibrant and hilarious man and watching him die and we were alone in the home and seeing all that you know it was like collapse for me i i collapsed i went into end times and it took a long time and i'm still working on recovering from that and i don't want people to think i'm saying i'm special but what i am saying is this i was made a free agent Mm. i was told that what we were doing was wrong and then i was set free my parents set me free with this feeling. And then I went about trying to survive because I had to live. You know, I got into, I dug myself a nice, big, righteous hole and was in it. And people were like, you're out of options. You're out of chances. You are, you have a problem. And um, so I, I started working and then I got successful because I'm a, I have white American male privilege and I'm, you know, not stupid and I can make people laugh. And so people like me and, and I started just moving along. I didn't have a college degree and still don't, uh, but I just started kind of climbing that ladder being, being put up the escalator. And, and all the while I had this gnawing inside me that it wasn't right. So as the moving forward through having some kids, getting a divorce, moving somewhere, I didn't want to live, having some more, you know, problems, always observing this um, and it's just like you say right awareness of one problem and then awareness of multiple problems and and then you get on the slippery slope so it's a real personal story because i felt that the awakening i had standing in west virginia with larry and then going to the white house and getting arrested and having that show of farce (laughs) unfold which was great it was proud but it's silly it's silly what what those actions are trying to do and we went to a movie screening in washington dc with the storm raining down hurricane sandy is raining down and we go to this movie theater to see a movie called end civ and civ and civ and it's the movie adaptation of end game or deep green resistance by Derek okay. jensen sure sure and it was it blew my mind open, right? I'd been softened by Larry and then that blew my mind open. And then someone handed us Ishmael. So by the time I got back to California, (laughs) I'm I'm halfway through reading Deep Green Resistance. I'm reading Ishmael. I've seen NSIV. I told Larry I'd fight till the death to, you know, defend the earth. And I mean, it was just, it was done. And, And I think I had also realized that there was a much deeper malevolence going on that had to do with being a civilization addict that had to do with the things that were good and bad Mm -hmm. and so we through our activism karen and i were immediately into the streets because we were evangelists for for the earth for environmentalism and the process of just directly aggressively engaging with people in the streets and and feeling that point of resistance to saying hey maybe it's you know, maybe it's the baby and the bathwater hardened us in a way that nothing else can to be here now, I'll say 10 years later, having tested our theory, talk to different people, come to grips with it and say, you know, we just need to, the, the problem is civilization. And the problem isn't them, or an external othering, the problem is us, as the comfort and convenience as the incredible energy slave power that we exert, the foods that we have, the the ability, the, the way we do farming, the way we do permaculture farming, the way we do everything is bound back to that. And so that's what that's what we're about. And I found you, Michael, in the usual way. And I said, this guy is working harder in the space that I want to be working alongside than anyone I've seen. And I know that people that have come before us that I'll mention specifically, like Guy McPherson, who uh, I I met eventually, but just consumed his information. And and that guy was a, he broke so much ground. I've climbed some mountains. And I know that if you're the first schlep up the hill and the fresh snow is sitting there, 
man, it's going to be a double day for you. Everyone else gets the stomp in your footprints. And Guy was out there and he's gotten yeah. Yeah. filleted. And uh, like all of us, he's a human and he's complicated. Yes. Uh, but he's he's been out there bravely. Derek Jensen is another guy who has yes. taken a lot of heat. And another person I love is John Zerzan. Yes. But here's the thing about these names and these books. That's, and this is the last little bit of my, my intro. Uh, I worked in business. And it, at a certain point, uh, sadly for everyone else, I was in charge. And I had uh, a desk in an office because that's what people in charge have. And I had a baseball in a glass case on my desk. And people would come in and sit down and say, because they knew I was, you know, I was a baseball fan. I've grown up. That's been my addiction is baseball. So they'd say, who signed the ball? Because they knew I collected baseball cards. And I said, I did. And it was true. I signed that damn baseball and put it in that little glass case and sat it on my desk because I want to be my own hero. And I want to, to be, and I want everyone to be that yeah. for themselves. There is no, there's, the books have been written, the stories have been told, but now it's time for campfire stories. Yeah where we all embody the shaman inside of us. And we all look around and we all say, hey, this is, this is who I am. I'm of this place, I'm of this earth. And I'm gonna bear witness and testify while the community of life is choked out by civilization. Yeah, yeah, wow. That was a rather kick-ass <laughs> introduction. That's great. Well, let me ask a question related rather, I mean, I'll come back to some of the other questions that I've asked other guests, but. Let me, let me sort of start with what are some of the metaphors that you found particularly useful? I mean, you're already, you've used a few. Um, you sent me a tweet that you had uh, recently, um, I'm imagining written, um, offered. But what I find so refreshing about you and Karen is there are literally very, very few people, but certainly very few couples that I feel like more immediately like aligned with like, damn, they share my heart, my mind, my, my sense of values and priorities and commitments, like, 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 holy shit, like, really? And so I want you to lean into some of that in terms of this sort of post do no gloom space. And, you know, sort of bridge building to Karen's my my post -doom conversation with Karen in terms of benefits, like what benefits? Well, for so two questions, one is sort of the metaphors that you found useful that I that you just sent me earlier. But then also sort of leaning into what for you have been some of the benefits of full out acceptance, like trusting collapse, trusting the inevitable extinction of homo colossus already in process, and the quite likely extinction of homo sapiens in the not too distant future. And I'm really grateful that you mentioned Guy McPherson, because, you know, very few people have had to take more heat, and more shit and more uh, judgment and, um, and, and it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, and so now that many of us, <laughs> I had somebody two years ago, send me a links to about four or five different articles and said, is this sort of the McPhersonization of the media? Like, it seems like more and more people are coming to this awareness that we're never getting back to normal, that in fact, normal is what got us in this mess in the first place. And it's now a predicament that's out of our control. There are tipping points that we have already passed, well passed, that are now in runaway mode. And, and we have very little agency on any large scale. And yet, there's not a lot of people talking about the benefits of that. Like, like what, what, what's the blessings? What, you know, Paul Traverka finding the gift on the other side of mere acceptance, the stages of grief, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But then on the other side of acceptance, really this whole post doom world of, 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 of benefits of uh, finding the gift of compassionate, um, courageous, compassionate engagement at a scale where you potentially can make a difference in terms of lessening, lessening suffering, in terms of helping other species possibly pass through this bottleneck, in terms of advocating for us to not be evil on a geological time scale, like assuming industrial civilization has eternal life. So we don't care, you know, we're not worried about the nukes, you know, the spent fuel rods, you know, we don't care about that because, hey, industrial civilization, progress or whatever. So yes, Derek Jensen, um, Lear Keith, Max Wilbur, I mean, these are brothers and sisters, this whole post-doom world of people who 
accept reality, accept that civilization is the problem. There's no saving civilization. And yet the recognition that that doesn't mean giving up. It doesn't mean giving up and not doing anything. It means, it means choosing carefully what we do. So anyway, I'm sort of going on, but I'd love for you to you share the, 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 the metaphors that you found useful. And then also, what are, some of the, what are some of the benefits? What are some of the gifts that you found from no longer being in the fight in the same way, but truly accepting what's inevitable and then engaging in compassionate, creative, generous contribution to your community and to the world, to the future without attachment to results. Awesome. I'm a soundbite machine. It's what I do. And so I try to capture them wherever I can. And I tweeted this, uh, the following, if it was obvious that we're all addicted to civilization, we could use the intervention, detox, rehab, live life day-to-day -day model. If it was obvious we had a terminal disease, we could use the diagnosis, hospice, live today fully with acceptance model. Or we can act like a five-year-old that broke the lamp, but is telling stories about a dragon that knocked it over and a unicorn that'll fix it instead of telling the truth and moving on. Because it's obvious that we're terminal addicts, evolved into homo colossus and on the way out. And I do think that addiction and hospice are the two, um, they're, they're frameworks that we really understand mm -hmm. and they're so common and I think they apply here. I, I'm, I'm convinced that our behavior is addictive and mm -hmm. you can find people that'll agree with a lot of that, but maybe not all of it, but we're addicted to the energy, the comfort and convenience, the real life that it provides. I'm not some dope. I understand that 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 the the energy slaves that we have it doesn't just produce the food or the gas and the cars it's the neonatal units and hospitals that save babies that are born prematurely it's it's the it's the services that help you if you get in a car accident and you're you know dying and i mean there's there's the guts and the glory always lined up and i i, I said at one point that you know a lot of people feel like it would really suck to live wild and free and get eaten by a jaguar. And I usually just say, well, would that really suck more than just being run down by one in a crosswalk? <laughs> yes, exactly. So really, if you think about it in just this, you know, binary way, civilization gets all the credit for everything good and all the blame for everything bad. So people suffer and people die and in miserable ways. They live excruciatingly miserable lives. And I'm not saying that they are miserable themselves, but the way we look at it through the lens of privilege, which we all have civilization privilege on the earth. I know a lot of the white American males have a lot more, but there's this baseline amount of privilege that's, that's, that roots us in. It's the monkey with the hand in the box that's holding the banana. You know, the hand that what we're holding the primate in us is holding civilization in that box and we won't let go. Um, but I think in the movie, Innocently Violent, which features Karen and I and some other folks, and it was made by someone who was making a film about police brutality, who was interviewing some friends of ours whose son had been killed by the police. Mm. And the filmmaker, Corey Rowe and Dylan Avery, they were the ones that made Loose Change 9-11, which is one of the more popular 9-11 series of movies and um, so when our friends had said these were the filmmakers do you know who they are I said yeah of course I know who they are and they were you know they're awesome people and they were taken and smitten by our spiel at the time and Corey started filming us and he came back and filmed us a number of times and I recommend watching the movie because it's an imperfect view of who I am it's not me saying who I am it's him taking some some film and there's a few scenes in there I'm like Man, I would have edited that. Hard edit, not showing that. Definitely not showing me trying to jumpstart the Suburban in my driveway. <laughs> Doesn't fit the narrative. Could we get me on a bicycle riding to, you know, the food bank or something cool like that? But, you know, that's the thing. It was very truthy. But I said in that movie, a problem properly stated is half solved. And I've always believed that. But we don't have a problem. We have a predicament. Yes, so we have a predicament. So a predicament properly stated is half accepted. 
And our predicament is, is overshoot, which is embodied through global industrial civilization, which began long, long, long ago in the, you know, if you want to go 12, 15,000 years, it's a, it's a whole series of things. The first carbon pool, the first expression of the fossil fuel energy was in the soil. So when they dug the soil in that top layer, I mean, that was the first, those are the plants and animal bodies that hadn't sunk way down and turned into oil, but there was a ton of it there. And so just churning that up produced this pulse of fertility that was ridiculous. It was the easiest. People talk about spindle top and the hundred to one um, energy return on energy invested from the first oil. I mean, to think about just kicking your soil into the ground and releasing mm. a whole bunch of nitrogen to, to grow food. So the, the when it started, the where it is, is, is way back. And we can be free from that though. So this moving into the, the benefits conversation is that addiction as an analogy, you know, you go through detox and it's hard. It's the hardest 72 hours you'll experience. And if you're an idiot like me, you'll experience it a few times. So you can go, wow, you know, I'm good at it. I don't really love to say that, but I'm really good at it. So just bring me that box of Kleenex and a bottle of water and I'm gonna sit here and shake. But um, the the tr the truth about that detox is that the clarity starts to wash over you on the back end of that and you realize how much of your identity had gotten bound up in the addiction and how you really thought that that was your essence your life and you start to reclaim yourself and i'm and i'm being vulnerable by saying this because people are to say oh he's just an, he's just he's got you know problems and so that's where all this comes from but i'm i'm really just trying to reach through and be a real human and yes. say that that I that was the thing for me. It bound up my identity, and I feel that now because I have a car, I have a computer, I'm on my computer, I have a cell phone, I go to the food store to buy food. I'm an ironic hypocrite, as we all are, because I'm trapped on the Titanic with everyone else. And I was born on the Titanic. I didn't build it. I didn't vote for it. I would have said I can't swim, and I'm afraid of the ocean, and I don't want on that boat. But all those things are true. So it's like, what do you if you and that's the same thing in addiction, right? You go in there, you go, these are all true things. I stole my grandfather's gold teeth and sold them to buy more methamphetamine. That's not a true story, by the way. <laughs> but you, you, you have, the bags are packed. The stories are there. So yeah. what do you do with the combination of all those stories? And now if you jump forward to the hospice side on the other end, when you finally get through the process of acceptance of the condition you have, that's when the lotus flower blooms. That's when the ability to live in the moment takes over the attempts to manage the moment and manage the future and manifest the future. And you can find something like clarity. So this is something like clarity for me. And it happened back in West Virginia. I'll be mm -hmm. honest about it. I knew right then that it was never going to be the same. And each yeah whack with the hammer on the nail was just driving it further in and happily for me i've always been a pro rewilding guy i've always been a pro community of life guy i am by nature and nurture not much of a civilization guy not much of a dominant culture guy i don't there's things i do that i like but i just it's not who i am and i know that i know that and reading ishmael didn't teach me anything but it it put that right into focus. And I am able to just fall back on that and say, this is not who we are. You know, there's not one right way to live and this is not how people should live. I was into tearing down the machine a la deep green resistance, mm -hmm. hopefully with as many people agreeing as possible and hopefully as, as uh, uh, legally as possible, <laughs> however that would work. Um, and I was never that kind of uh, above ground guy. I, I'm not an underground guy. I was an above ground guy. So I'm communicating about here's the problem. You know, mm -hmm. what should we do? And Max Wilbert is brilliant in this. And he understands better than anyone. He's doing a lot to keep his, you know, his feet on the ground. But that warrior stance started to lose some of its flavor for me around Guy McPherson and talking about the collapse of industrial civilization has consequences for us in the aerosol masking effect and the nuclear meltdowns. Um, I also include that there's 
you know, there's a ton of really creepy biological weaponry that we've got locked up in freezers all over the world. So it's easy to see just the number of Pandora's boxes that are everywhere. It's yes. really, really bad. So the amount of work that would have to be done is, is enormous. So I, I kind of shifted because I'm interested in, in cleaning up the mess, not fixing things for Homo Colossus. I want to talk about the freedom that comes from identifying those real predicament drivers and talking about eliminating them. And even if you can't, if you go into, if you go into addiction recovery, you can't fix the original problem. You can accept it and move forward with it, mm -hmm. with something, again, like clarity. And so I find tons of benefits in trying to take that warrior activist inside me that was so enthralled with the passionate fury inside deep green resistance and the relentless communicator that also lives up here in my ego and and try to figure out keep keep digging so mm -hmm. what karen and i do is we just keep digging we never stop and and so the the things that i think are are critical is to talk about collapse, normalize collapse, mm -hmm. get to acceptance. And then the things that would open up there, you know, it's kind of like talking to someone on day one of detox, right? Day one of rehab. There's, you know, we can, we can talk, but we're not going to really get anywhere. Get mm -hmm. back to me in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm wanting, I feel it when we do our, uh, you know, post doom, no gloom calls. Um, when I continue to talk to friends and family who have been listening to me for years, I feel that that they're still caught up in that. And that's that collapse aware, but not collapse accepted. Yeah. You know, right? Uh, anyone who's ever, I'll just say drank too much, right? <laughs> it's 1130, you're, you're shit faced. You're going to bed and you're like, I have to quit. There is no part of me that can keep doing this. And you know what? Tomorrow, I'm drunk right now, but tomorrow's the day. Mm -hmm. And then by 11 o'clock the next day, when you're like, oh, man. Okay, I got to I got to need a drink. But tomorrow <laughs> it's going to be something. Yeah. And so when you're when there's so much awareness because we're in that in that mode, in that civilization mode, that addiction mode that but it, and it comes out for people. They say we're collapsing. This is ending. It's the politics, it's the money, it's the it, there's a million different things that they'll attribute it to, but it really is that awareness is right there. It's just simmering, simmering, simmering. And I want to do the intervention and help maybe people get through that. Yeah. Because the other thing I said, and I'll finish with this, in the, at, at, the, at the, the end of the innocently violent movie, mm -hmm. I said, the real issue is that after all this activism, I know that people have to choose this. I can't convince anyone. Mm -hmm. I can wave my hands and maybe point in a different direction but they have to choose it. So it really is a, the testifying is important. The being present for people as they start to come on is important. Mm -hmm. And that's where Karen's benefits conversation is really incredible because that's where this has to go because it can't be a boohoo fest. It has to be an affirmation. And we have the gift of life. We are in this amazing community of life on this wondrous earth. And with all the problems and all the predicaments and, and the outcome being certain that it's not great for us in this mode, there's joy in every day. And there's joy in being present with the community of life, testifying and, and insisting on speaking your truth. And I will, I'll go down on the deck of the Titanic saying, you know, fuck this ship. <laughs> or... Look at the stars! Isn't this kick ass? You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, this water is my, cold. <laughs> I have my swear jar, so that's one quarter for the swear jar. Um, I do have, you know, I have a list of things that 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 they're not adjacent to the benefits conversation, but they're, you know, people say, "What are you talking about in terms of uh, collapse or a planned collapse or a just collapse or a right. decrease resistance?" And so, for me, that's where I'm able to to discuss with people what what I would suggest doing none of my suggestions are fixing anything but they're their actions so cool yeah you know, go we, for it we say we're not hopeless we hope less oh, wow. I'm not a doomer 
I do more. So there's a ton of work to do. I know Connie works so hard at helping trees migrate that can't migrate. Um, the, the amount of passion that surrounds rivers that flow into deltas that start in forests and the forests are fed by the salmon. It's just a literal relationship loop. And I'm so in love with nature, you know, and I love can be a funny thing where you're like, what is that? Well, when I see a little mushroom on the side of the trail and I'm walking, I know what love is because I just swoon. And when I see little birds, when I see free flowing water, when I see the clouds coming over the ridge, all of those things just take me to the place that I am of, which is universal consciousness and the, you know, connectedness of everything. Oh, and I think we all this. feel that even people that aren't, you know, naturalists or environmentalists. Uh, I worked at a campground for a number of years. I know that a bunch of people who could give two craps about nature go camping all the time, but they still swoon over the bark on the trees and want to know stories about why the, you know, the little um, newts hang out under the, the pine bark that you can find and turn over and how mushrooms and how mycelium works. And they just go, because you're, again, I'm not, I'm opening up that flower that's inside them you know i'm not stuffing something into their brain it's it's in us it's in all of us yeah. and so um the things to do the work to do let's see there's a, a be a, a so number one there's 14 of them there's number one be a good member of the community of life work daily with something alive that is not human without trying to control it and you can do this anywhere you can be fully engaged with um, a, even a domesticated creature, but undomesticated creatures, just participating, bearing witness. I see you. I see you, little bird. Oh. Um, number two, enjoy to the best of your ability the daily gift of life on earth among the community of life. Karen talks about this at the end of hers. You know, we really owe it to the community of life to see it and to love it. And you don't really have to try very hard. <laughs> right. And then we get into, you know, functional things. Number three, support universal basic income for all and a livable sum, not these kind of petty little amounts that they're talking about. The money's not real. Stop being petty. You know, they can mint the platinum coin, the trillion dollar coin. I don't, I, you know, I've, I've had a lot, I've talked to a lot of people that are high on methamphetamine and I've talked to a lot of economists and honestly, they sound very much the same. Yeah. Yeah. So insofar as it's a transaction enabler and none of the material goods that exist exist because of the money they just move back and forth because of it you know that, so that's a real functional thing when you talk about um i think we won't talk to the youth about what's going on and collapse because then how do you send them back to taco bell for their job after that right, right. how do you convince them that it's still a reasonable thing to go through and it's difficult i'm not saying that these aren't easy things. Living in civilization is not easy. The baseline state of existence is very trying. It's emotionally trying. It's physically trying. The pressures on people are real and significant. So getting that, that boot off the neck is important. Um, then, you know, then I just go crazy. Number four, cease all development, military force, industrial projects, including logging and fishing. So you just, you know, you just stop it all. We got to <laughs> figure something else out. Again, this is addiction. This is detox. You don't get to bring a dime bag in the detox. <laughs> right. You go walk into AA and you're like, hey, where's the bar? I need something to take the edge off, if you know what I mean. <laughs> That's not the way this works. And it's right. tough, but you know, you can, you can do it. Uh, five, remove all threats to the biosphere from existing and spent nuclear facilities and weapons. Pretty easy. That's a common one. <laughs> Pretty easy. Yeah, that's one of the most important ones. Sure. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's easy, but by yeah. God, I sure hope it, it becomes that. And, and again, part of this is that even it, some people would say, well, we, I had a guy who was reminding me on Twitter that that wasn't possible in a variety of very smart ways. And I said, so are you telling me I shouldn't identify it as, as a predicament that needs to be addressed? Like I should just keep quiet about it then? Cause that's not it. I'm not saying any of these things are doable, right. but I am saying that the, when you make the list of things you need to do to save your life, you don't have to front end it with, is this possible? I mean, right. it's just the list. It's the practical list. Exactly. exactly. Um, 
Number six, kind of a dismantle all weapon systems, including bioweapons, plagues, and viruses. I don't want to step into the Wuhan lab controversy, but the truth is, is that every nation state on this earth is tinkering with every possible crazy idea, if only to make sure that in case someone else uses it against them, that they understand how it works. So the number of DARPA type freezers filled with nutty stuff is, is much more significant than we probably would like to know. So there's yeah. a lot of work to do around that. Yep. And this isn't to benefit humanity. This is to benefit the community of life. Amen. Um, and I put this on number seven. It's number one for me. Remove all dams, rewild all rivers and deltas. Um, and then for, for Connie too, and people that love the forest, you know, that's the forest as well. So it's just about, um, it's just about being honest that we cannot use that as a function of having people in overshoot in cities and then supporting the type of industrial agriculture we do. Yes. So um, that's just how that works. Uh, number eight, terminate scale agriculture and animal production. And I put in the scale thing there to appease my permaculture friends who want to talk about various ideas of sustainable agriculture, which again, I'm not gonna step into that um, steel cage death match. But I will say that, you know, industrialized food production and industrialized animal production is, you know, just one of those things you'd have to quit. Um, yeah, but but before you go on from that, because I fully agree, um, say a little, just a little bit, this would be a good place to just interject a little bit of what chicken foot ranch is or has been in the past and sort of like th that that when you talk about permaculture it's not just some abstract thing you've read in a book somewhere right when when we departed our suburban life and we're in a blended family and we have five kids i like to say that we're not a part of the population problem because there's six adults involved in the <laughs> i don't know in all the marriages that have produced from these original two there's six adults and there's five kids, so <laughs> something like that. We're we're at a one to one you, ratio. You you are absolved. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. And my kids are all wonderful, so they're not part of the problem. Yeah, right. Um, um, the so the idea, you know, I, I say that we got the memo. Like I just got the the echo memo. Go grow food. Go make soil. Go be resilient. You know, it wasn't really called rewilding and it certainly wasn't sa saying find feral like we do, but it was to go be something like back to the land. And we just went hard at it. We went full on. And I watched uh, Bill Mollison's, uh, I pirated Bill Mollison's permaculture class. So I watched that because I'm an anarchist. Yeah. And, um, and it was really smitten by it. You know, Bill and Jeff Lawton oh, yeah. and all those guys, they're just, they're full of love and energy. And it's so interesting. And it was, it was amazing as a kid who spent a lot of time doing those things with my parents early on to have that, you know, come back through me as an adult. And it's also the, you know, the creature born wild and free. You really start to mine that creature within you when you get your hands in the soil. Yeah. But what happened really quickly was we just realized we were, we were running a concentration camp for plants and animals. And, you know, the fences got stronger. Um, the, the, the war against nature, which is that I was insistent on some things living and insistent on some things not living. And I created this line, right? And the deer were on the wrong side of the line for sure. And the, the, the different pests and the the solutions and i know because I've, I've had this conversation on twitter and people come at me and they all have an answer because there's an answer to every single one of these and i get it and i love you for it but it won't ever scale yeah so I, i'll just i'll tell the quick story about a rabbit named stew okay and a friend of mine thad love you thad he uh brought me a rabbit that he had said his daughter had had but had decided that it wasn't fun anymore and was just sitting in a cage and we had chickens and ducks in our chicken and duck penitentiary up the hill it was you know super authentic and very diy i followed all the proper um steps and i i took the rabbit and we we're like oh we need to you know protect the rabbit and i'm like you know from what and you know they're like from all the different creatures and and so i you know, put in the special rabbit box next to the duck box next to the chicken box. And, 
and the rabbit would sit there for a little while. And I thought, well, that kind of sucks. Let's just let the rabbit out because I'm not really going to keep rabbits at the scale that you see. If you want to go like horrifying mode, look at rabbit keeper people. They're wow. So I'm like, this rabbit's going to live free and die. So however it works. So the rabbit started hanging out with the chickens in the chicken coop. And that was cool. And then the rabbit disappeared. And I thought, well, that experiment ended kind of quick. And then I swear I started seeing the rabbit like outside of our property, outside of the fence line, cruising around. And then she started coming in and I have this thing. I love animals and I always want to touch them because I'm a petting zoo guy, right? You, like we're all raised in this petting zoo mentality, like cats and dogs and camels and llamas and everything. So I want to touch them. And, and so I, I, I looked at Stu and I said, I want to grab you so bad, but I promise I'm not gonna. And so she just hung around. She just started hanging around me, hanging around and getting closer and closer. And after a couple of months of that, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to pick you up because obviously we have a relationship now and I can't stop myself. And, and, and so she just sat there and I picked her up and I had this love affair with this, this rabbit. And we all did. Stu was amazing. And a, a profound thing and what Stu did is rewilded herself and wow. we watched it she was in a cage in a laundry room and came here and then said I'm going to go outside that fence you're not going to keep me in a box I'm going to go outside that fence and I'm going to live and and I'm going to then I'm going to come back and I'm going to be changed and I'm going to change you so we say in case of civilization rewild yourself first then help others oh and that's Stu great. helped us right wow. Stu came back and 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 gave herself up for me and one thing i say about you know how i so know so so, I so when i hear the word stew i think guy and gave herself so it was stew male or female female or okay yeah i think that is a very funny guy so it was you know rabbit stew is <laughs> okay oh that oh got it okay good 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 okay good that's helpful and um so the the power of that lesson is really what started we just started tearing down all the cages and the creatures that weren't able to exist after that you know just we didn't we didn't keep them yeah. and um and we don't have chickens and we don't have ducks and i i grow a little bit of food but i don't i rely on a food forest kind of a operation which is that way more wild food grows around me than i can grow and all the, the non-native foods that need defense and water and maintenance that I'm trying to grow are, they're not working out well because I have to manage their life. And just like right. Stu taught me, right. you, you can't run this show. And, and with the chickens, the last thing with the chickens was I saw a bunch of little birds, just call them goldfinches. And they landed, I was out in the garden, I'm sitting down. And, and they all landed around me and they started doing the same thing with the scratching and the hopping and scratching and the hopping and pecking and pecking. And I thought, oh, wow. So if you get into permaculture, they talk about like environmental services chickens do. And, you know, they, they do this, they churn the soil, they're pooping and peeing and, you know, they're weeding and they're eating bugs. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, these little birds do it by the dozens. And I don't manage their babies. If their babies live or die, it's not on me. I don't have to water them or feed them or move their poop around. Everything that you take on, you're like, I'm moving poop around. So the, the rewilding part that came over us was a lesson learned from the, the domestication that's built into keeping animals and keeping plants mm -hmm. and trying to have them be be underneath your homo colossal umbrella. Mm -hmm. And my, my suggestion is there's no separation from that. There's no way to be out of that loop. Maybe if, you know, there, there are, but not within the civilizational meme that we have. Right. So I am, I am all about love for people that are doing permaculture. And, and I know there's, their hearts are huge and their intent is pure. Um, and, but I, I do want to point out that, that they, they involve a lot of containing of nature, mm -hmm. I guess, make it running it for your benefit. It's a mm -hmm. very homocentric activity. Mm -hmm. Creatures need to eat. 
and beavers make dams and creatures displace nature for their own needs. So we will do that at some scale, but the way that we do it is, is not appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it, I can easily get into trouble bashing permaculture. And so I don't want to do that. If yeah. I love no, permaculture, I love you and be well. Yes. No, I mean, I, I, I did my permaculture training at the farm in Tennessee and Peter Bain and, and uh, Chuck Marsh were my permaculture trainers back, back in the day in the mid nineties. And I've known and loved Peter Bain, who was the editor of the permaculture activist for, you know, ever since then. And his partner, uh, Keith Johnson are just dear friends uh, here in Michigan as well. And so I, I've got a serious positive heart for, you know, permaculture, agroecology, anything and everything that participates with the wisdom and ways of the living world. But I also am well aware that we are looking at an abrupt climate regime that looks like three, four, five, six, who knows how many degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, where it's quite likely, it seems to me, that no mammal larger than this that can burrow into the ground is likely to survive even as soon as, you know, a few decades from now. And so what I encourage is, you know, follow your heart, be engaged in every kind of regenerative practice that you can possibly be engaged in. Support indigenous resistance because they're the ones that are still passionately in love with Gaia, with earth, with the creator, with, you know, the living body of life as a greater thou, not a lesser it. And they're the ones that are, are doing more to protect biodiversity and doing more to defend the water and the soil and the land and so forth. To, so I'm in all about trying to encourage those who are in the privileged white, whatever, but really everybody to engage in that as much as possible. So I've got nothing but positive things to say about permaculture and things like that. And we are now living in the real end times, like not the mythic end times, not just sort of, you know, some theological fantasy land, but like really for for real like these these are the last this is the last generations of humans to be alive my daughter who gave birth 22 months ago is quite likely to be among i would say put it at over 80 percent likely to be in the last generation of mothers who can have babies of of, of of families with with young children and so how do we be in all of that and how do we do so with hearts of love rather than bitterness or cynicism or you know that's why uh, i I, I like your little word plays and things like that. You know, I'm not a doomer. I do more, you know, little things like that. Th those are cute because they're sort of jogging the memory. But it seems to me, you know, that really the question is how do we support each other in a dealing with the grief that is absolutely inevitable, absolutely must to my mind, the single greatest addiction of all that will cause irreparable harm in the future and causes tremendous suffering for individuals and families now is opium addiction. It's being addicted to a comforting belief of the future, a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, or ecology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's opium is definitely the, the main drug. I, I did invent a new uh, drug for that, which is copium, which is another, which I would say there's a lot of copium strategies that are hooking people into actions that they believe are unrealistically restorative. That, and so, but I'm, I'm also very sensitive to horizontal hostility, which is something if you read Deep Green Resistance, they'll talk a lot about that. I mean, two things I would say to people it, heading into a kind of a more radical unraveling is to learn about security culture and learn about horizontal hostility. I don't know. I don't know about either of those. So feel free yeah, to elaborate. Yeah, they're, they're good things. You can poke them up. There's things on, they're in Deep Green Resistance and you can look on their website. And security culture just talks about how to communicate safely in a world that isn't really designed for people to be radical activists and just to kind of keep your head on a swivel and, and, and be aware. And a lot of that was based on Deep Green Resistance, very purposely suggesting people engage in, um, activities to dismantle civilization exactly without yeah. without approval and then the horizontal hostility is important too though we get into this where we're set on ourselves 
Um, the, the, so when I say something bad about permaculture and then I fire up you know, the permaculture slice of the wheel of answers, um, that can feel like I'm attacking them for their good works. The same thing comes up with solar and wind and renewable energy people is that, you know, they're, they're the variations which come down to like, well, you got to do something. And I'm like, well, you know, not that though. I have a lot of really horrible stories about things that could have been done in concentration camps or prisons to make, you know, slight increases. And under those conditions, yeah, they make sense. But the the, the main issue is that the concentration camp exists, not what right. you're doing with the bodies when they are pushed out or you know, making subtle improvements to the food. So, so saying those things without appearing to be participating in horizontal hostility is important to me. Um, whatever your, your particular point of engagement is with the predicament, um, human rights, there's a lot of people that are you know, super concerned and almost exclusively concerned about the suffering of people in the Southern hemisphere yep. or people they identify as you know, not being part of the, um, the super privileged class. And so if I said something like, you know, I think one of the problems is globalism. I really do. Like, why does the weight of everything that happens around the world have to be on my shoulders? I can't do anything about it. And I'm not, I'm absolutely not saying that I don't care about people in Madagascar. I love people in Madagascar and I want all the good things for them, but I shouldn't really know anything that's going on in Madagascar. And in a world that didn't have global industrial civilization, I wouldn't. No, exactly. I mean, I've said many times uh, along these lines that our, the way our brains and our emotions and our hormones and sort of everything inside of us that makes us go and drives us and has us feel this way, that or whatever, all of those evolved to pay attention to news, that is things that are real and potentially impactful locally. And so we naturally pay attention to things, especially anything that has to do with you know, on the positive end, reproduction, sex, good food, you know, great foods, whatever, interesting people, but also, especially on the negative threats of all different kinds and everything else. So we're, we're used to that local of paying attention. And that's the news. And those were all things that we could at least potentially make a difference with. Now we are bombarded because of globalization, because of the internet, because of technology that allows us to see, hear, and thus feel stuff that's happening to people and other creatures all over the world. Our emotions are engaged in that. And we don't have unlimited bandwidth. We don't have an, uh, an unlimited capacity to feel and then get anything productive done in the rest of our lives. And yep. so if that's why doom scrolling is such a problem today, it's an, it's another form of addiction to an aspect of civilization, which is things that we know about the world that we actually can't make any difference with whatsoever. And yet impact us emotionally and time-wise and nervousness, and then have us reach for whatever soothes our, our pain, whatever addiction or whatever substance of choice that triggers our dopamine that we've used since we were teenagers to, to cope. And I know that the word feral uh, is important for you and Karen. Just say something about that. Right. So we're domesticates. Humans are domesticated, uh, invasive, apex predators, homo colossuses, I shouldn't say humans. And a, a, that story about Stu is the same. Stu became feral. Stu didn't become wild. And even in Stu's feralness, she came back closer to the domesticated wheel, but she came back rewilded into that and then held her paw out for me. And so I cannot be wild. I was born wild and free, but I was domesticated. And so my only path forward, but call it back, however you want to directionalize it, is through feral. My kids can't be wild. I domesticated my children in cooperation with the machine that I agreed to them being in. And so they can be feral. And when we say find feral, we, you know, I said, I'm, if I'm in this machine, I'm going to make, I'm going to participate in making bad robots, feral kids to some degree. And so the, and I know there's a feral kid movement that you can get into, which is more oh, really? about them, I didn't know like wandering the streets and okay. you know, stuff like, but that's not what I'm talking about at all. And, and I'm a realist, right? Because I don't want to suggest to people a false goal. If I say, oh, let's just rewild. 
um, that doesn't, you're not going to get there. If you go right. to rehab, you're not going to not be an addict. You are always and still an addict. Your bags are packed, carry them to the finish line. How you carry them matters. And there is something like salvation within that. So how do I carry myself into wild with a feral suit on? And I can see it, but I can't really be it. So when we say find feral, we mean that as a way to orient yourself in a different way. Mm -hmm. Admit that you're domesticated. Mm -hmm. Admit that you're a civilization addict. Mm -hmm. And then find that other thing in you that is the way station between here and there. And we're mm -hmm. never going to get there. I'm not saying we're right. going to get there. Right. But nor would I say to someone um, that they should, when, when we get into the whole, like, are you quitting? Are you giving up? No, no, God, no. I'm not wired like that. I'm a, I'm a kid who's, who's, you know, had, I had to learn to live the things that happened to me when I was a kid, which, um, you know, I, I'm a survivor. Mm -hmm. I'm a fighter. Mm -hmm. I never quit. I will never give up the things I hold true in my heart. I'm going to go all the way to the finish with them. Yeah. So people that want to suggest I'm giving up, you know, you're, you're dead wrong. I'm going to find that I'm going to get a glimpse at that wild and free creature inside me through the lens of being feral and, and think about that in the context of the community of life, which I actually have allegiance to, which is not homocentric, which is a combination of creatures, big and small. And, and that's, the, that's the place that I want to stick my picket pin in the ground and uh, you know, battle to the finish. I, I know there's, in the, in the discussion about the benefits of collapse acceptance, sometimes you know, fighting or battling or warrioring get, you know, can get sled, set aside but for me like that's you know who i am i'm gonna i'm gonna appear to be you know battling i can't just kind of sit quietly yeah so finding a way to ground that energy is is critical for my survival for my copium i have to ground that energy i keep there's been different times where we're like that's it no more activism no more articles get the message hang up the phone i'm done i'm not going to do these self-help groups i don't want to save these humans anyway everyone i go to i go to these 350 meetings and i just want to blow up the building <laughs> you know something i want to i want to cycle back for, i'm loving this by the way i want to cycle back because you were starting to go through numbers you know one yep. two three four so uh i want to make sure you complete that process it's good too because we broke at just the the right the right place okay so good. we're on to number nine um Mobilize vast numbers of trained death doulas able to assist families as population dwindles. Yes. yes. So uh -huh. you talked to Stephen Jenkinson, who I really love. And here I am saying I'm not going to highlight a bunch of people in the expert class, but Stephen is able to capture sentiments that I haven't heard uh, captured otherwise. And I think it's another one of those shadows when we talk about collapse is the fear about, you know, there's a, pra there's a very practical part about death. And I know you and Connie have done a lot of work around this. So you know as well as or better than anyone, but we need to put that up on the top three list of things to talk about. And that that's one of those things that Amen. none of this stuff on this list will happen, but that will happen. Yes, we'll need exactly. to exactly. figure out um, how we interact with that. And, and we'll get really good at it. There's a story, you know how they say that the worst thing that can happen to a parent is for their child to die before them. And I agree. I have kids. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to say that that's a good thing, but I am going to say this, that for the vast majority of human history, almost every parent would have exactly. lost one or more children exactly. uh, during their lifetime. Yes. So do we have the structural skills inside of us to navigate that? Yes. Is it joyful? I'm not going to go that far, but it's, it's a damn lie that we don't have that gear in the in the toolbox. Oh. Uh, number 10, convert all empty buildings to livable free housing. Mm. You know, here we are again, the, you know, money's not real and we have plenty of buildings, safe, dry, bathrooms, all that stuff. And yep. I, I remember when I was, you know, I was kind of counterculture as a kid. So I'd go around, I'd like, wow, how can this building be vacant? You know, like homeless guy vacant building and even then you know i just thought there's there's an easier answer here and i know i'm just like a square peg trying to jam myself into the round hole 
I, I get it. Practical person who's going to come and say why that's not possible in private property and ownership and how if you even give these people a home, they, they actually don't always treat it well. Blah, 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 blah. Don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Don't care. That's a predicament. That's my answer. Yeah. Uh, number 11, compassionately ramp down advanced medical and pharmaceutical services. Mm. There's another big thing we don't really like to talk about quite mm -hmm. part out loud. Um, there's a lot of, you know, you just can't have it. I used to talk a lot about turning off the power. And when we were doing street activism, and I would say, you know, and I'm not just talking about turning off the power to the stuff that we know is bad. I'm turning off the power to the hospitals too. Yeah. And I'm not doing that because I don't love people. I'm just saying, if you make me grandfather in the hospitals, I'm grandfathering in everything. Yeah. And so in relation to the, the core kind of where are we at, where does the rubber meet the road? A lot of people were overpopulated, we're an overshoot. And, and, and there's parts to that, that, that don't oftentimes come to the top of the list to discuss. All right, let me just jump in one real quick on this, because, you know, prior to 125, 130 years ago, I mean, civilizations existed without electricity, but our kind of civilization now, the, the fundamental addiction for those of us who are addicted to civilization, which is damn near all of us, is electricity. And, and it's a profound addiction. And, and most of us couldn't fathom living without electricity. And many of us would, would starve because we don't know how to grow food or hunt food or preserve food or, you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, continue. It's, it's true, though. And I, I, the, the compassionate part of that is really important. How do we compassionately do it? And yeah. I think that it starts with conversations. So these are uh, prompt suggestions, conversations, right. <laughs> suggestions uh, to get into. Uh, number 12, and this is dedicated to Connie, uh, assisted migration of plants and animals. And so trees especially, yes. And trees especially. The, the forest is life. I mean, the forest began and is the foundation and the root of, of advanced existence in a lot of ways. And I'm such a mycology mushroom geek that you know, that's where my deep passion is. Sure. Um, but it, 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 and, I, and I love rivers and I love mushrooms. But they all, they, they're all like under the forest canopy, so to speak, yes, right. and how everything is, is interconnected. Um, and I do, again, though, here is like the horizontal hostility. You'll quickly, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this with people that it's controversial when you talk about this as a step to do. Um, there's like the native plant movement that you can get into. Well, no, man, they'll just undress you for that <laughs> one. You know, no, we have to. We have to do these things, but it's it's important to talk about. Yeah. So we're down. There's the what to do. There's just two items left, and they're very, um, they're also very meaningful. Number thirteen, prepare for refugees, or prepare to be a refugee. Yes, exactly. And and so this is again, I'm not discounting our responsibility to the whole of the community of life, all the living creatures, but I, I refuse to be homocentric except in, in the case of realistically recognizing that, that, that suffering will occur. And, and so exactly. thinking about, and, and maybe like so much of the, we're presuming that, oh, well, it'll, I'll have to help other people. So put yourself, you are the refugee. The distance you have to fall from the tree you've climbed is exactly equal to how far you've gone up. And, you know, dominant culture, Western culture, as we see it, you know, the, the, the we are, are up in the top part of that tree. Exactly. And so the clinging is that much more important because you're sure to die. I That's mean, you're exactly. like, I can't, some people are thinking, oh, I'm so sick of drinking this muddy water with fecal matter in it. And other people are saying, oh shit, Starbucks is closed and I can't go golfing. <laughs> For, for them, you know, like the, the mental pressure of that is kind of the same, but then as you, nope, nope, there's no tea times available today, and then you're actually drinking the muddy water with fecal matter in it, that, then you have really, you know, now you're getting your deep lesson. So imagine, uh, and, and, and in there is, is rewilding too, because it, it imagines you being a refugee from civilization, right. in effect, which would be feral, you'd be feral, you'd yeah, be but before had at a truck stop. Right. Before we get to that point, I've, Connie and I have our own exit strategy. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that and so that's great. Number 14, and for the win, figure out how you'll end your life if when you must and help others do the same. Uh -huh. And I'm not suggesting you help others end their life, but you help others. And this is what we do in the post doom thing is by we're creating the space for this conversation to happen calmly and compassionately. Amen. And, and these are hard things yes. to talk about. And you could easily be looked at as however bad you want to say it, criminal, insane, um, defeatist, but it's the failure to plan is planning to fail. And I, I think that on our, on our calls, there are so many people that are in a city, in an urban environment, and they're saying, what do I do? What do I do? Grow food on the roof? Right. Um, and, and my answer is, there's nothing you can do. Right. I got the memo more than 10 years ago, and we bugged out. We cashed out all of our retirement. We begged, we begged for help and received loving help from, from family. And I recognize you can all call me a privileged white guy, and I get it. I can't undo that. But, but the thing we did was to get on a lifeboat. As soon as we heard the boat hit the iceberg, I was on the lifeboat. Yeah. Now you're all clamoring around and I get your pain and I want to help, but I, there's only so much I can do. And, and so I would say very realistically and very humbly as, as calmly as I can, that just know how you would wrap it up. Yeah. And that, and that can give you, um, if you, if you go with the idea that we're part of universal consciousness. Yeah. I, I, I just so you know, cause you've used that three times, that language is not language that Connie and I use, although I get, I think I get and, and fully aligned with where you're coming from. For me, it's just that we are part of this one living reality in which we live and move and have our being, this one cosmos, this one material and immaterial reality. I stumble over the word consciousness just because of the way it's sometimes used in some context. That's all. So I just wanted to. Yeah, but yes, that's a great we're, point. We're part of this. It's absolutely unfairal of me to have this extremely uh, nuanced point of view, which is which has been mined from watching a ton of content and looking inside myself sure. and trying to settle on terminology that that I feel like I can I can go to go to work with. I would much prefer to have no words because I think words limit. So if you if you're with someone and you've lived in a land base for 50 generations and uh, and he says, see this oak tree and you go, I don't call it an oak tree. And he goes, oh, you are an ignorant person and you don't know what this tree is. While you know, you know who that tree is, you know the very being of that tree and it would defy expression. So almost everything I'd say, I'd rather feel. Beautiful. But it would be a super boring Zoom call <laughs> if I just felt everything. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, it was interesting because the first time that you said that you, you paused just before you said, and we returned to, and, and and then you paused and you said universal consciousness. And I almost completed the sense to the soil or something like that, you know? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, there, brother, this is, uh, uh, yes. So, so, so uh, I, I want to wrap this up just because Connie's going to have a lot to, to, to work with, uh, but, but anything that you'd like to say to really bring this particular conversation to completion, because I really love this. I want to be a very loving, compassionate, advocate for the community of life. And that puts me at odds with homo colossus and civilization. But that doesn't put me at odds with love and presence and being. And it strikes me as meaningful that almost everyone that pursues a psychoactive journey to learn more about themselves comes away with a feeling of not being afraid of dying. Exactly. And so I, uh, here we go again, I coined a new term, it's FOMO'd, 
Is it not FOMO? Mode? FOMO. It's fear of my own death. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. And I face that. I've lived with death in my life. I know, I, fe I fear, I have deep feelings about that. The journey that I'm on is to not have the fear of my own death, but have the joy of my own life. Because the purpose of life is death and the purpose of death is life. And the gift of life we have from the second you inhale your first breath and with all the creatures that ride along with you that far outnumber the yous in you, you are experiencing an extraordinary gift that doesn't have an expiration date and doesn't have a set of coursework. And it, it's meaningful what we say to people. And if we say to ourselves first and then others that you have lived a full life and you have from the very beginning and the fullness of that life is expanding like the universe is expanding and it's never contracting. Those who are alive have all lived and no one yet to be born will ever die. The gift is among us. The privilege is here. The question is, what will we do with it? And what I want to do with it is help make this space that might be the thing that they talk about as consciousness awakening or the turning. It might be the end times as was talked about in the Bible. It doesn't matter to me. The next right thing to do is the next right thing to do. And for me, it's bearing witness and testifying as a part of the community of life as we head into certain death. That's what it is, but it's joyful. And I want people to be able to mine that joy and feel good about the thing that they're experiencing, which is amazing life. So thank you, Michael, for what you do. I'm filled with joy to have a brother to, to, to ride with. And I have such respect for the, the, the risks you've taken. And I want to take those risks. And I want other people to be emboldened by seeing us taking those risks. I, I'm breaking snow. I'm no hero but I want to make a trail for all of us because I'll need you to break some snow for me, just like you have Michael and just like everyone else has. So let's do it together and let's live with joy, regardless of the outcome. Aho, Amen.